whether I'm something like the semantic solder in this kind of welding operation, I don't know. And whether I will mention the ontology word at some point, coming from a philosophical background, an archaeological background, and an IT background. So there you go. It, it can be done. Also, just to credit some of my partners, particularly colleagues at the University of South Wales, although I'm here with a Historic England hat on and that they have paid for me to be here, I do research work here with colleagues who have also worked a lot on the Ariadne projects and other European projects, so there's quite a lot of commonality here as well. Now it's going to be, to some people in the room, although not as many as I thought there might be, a trip down memory lane with some of these slides, because I've reached a point in some of this research where I actually have to put slides out to remind myself things I've done in the past. But the basis behind the work and research work and more of what I'm going to talk about is obviously about linking up what I used to know in this slide is now, what, 15 years, the archaeological archipelago, the idea that there are these different approaches and views to what we call archaeological. Now, I coined this phrase heritage data. So moving on to this, you know, in, in, in my world of historic England or former English heritage, you had a standard to try and represent some of these sort of information ideas and categories that were most commonly occur. And this was, a, this was an, another early sort of representation of something called MIDAS, a Monument Inventory Data Standard in, for the UK. So it might be widely used, but actually moving to the ontological approach, we started to look at this from a more conceptual viewpoint in terms of trying how these, on this model, like the lines don't really mean anything. But the crucial thing is, like, more and more that you start to look at these diagrams, you actually think it's the relationships between what's in those boxes, which is almost more important in terms of understanding what we're trying to do with the data. So at that high level, that ontological, dare I say it, conceptual level, those are the sorts of concepts that, that those, that standard was covering. And we moved, I moved, uh, and I did some more work and, and luckily got joined up with these chaps in, in in force uh, in, in, in Crete, Martin Durr and, and, and many others since working on this CDOT CRM. And okay, they have more complex ways of doing this, as you can tell, even from just reading the things, the, the, the concepts that they're talking about and the identifiers. But, you know, at the simplest level, those conceptual entities are in that model too. And that's kind of semantics in a, in a nutshell. <laughs> I think. Um, so moving on to that, so the sort of work that then became the basis of well, some of my AHRC funded work with, with colleagues and then was moved, moved forward in, in, in sort of the early work or earlier work of Ariadne, which is now Ariadne Plus and will continue to be used in that. This idea, we start, and, and other people have been talking more about this in terms of trying to search for concepts within some of our data. Now in particular, the work we were doing was not just looking into the data in databases where you, you've got quite structured data, but I just wanted to highlight this work, which is more using something called natural language processing, where you're actually trying to pick, pick out those entities in free text. And that's, I think, sort of where it links in, particularly with, with the nature of this particular session where we're talking about corpora and, and large text information spaces, where we have to try and sort of try and to least pull out the sorts of information that we might be looking for. So this was just really to give a, a flavour of how that starts to be used. As I mentioned, obviously, CDOC CRM as a, as a cause of international standard used widely um, now for, in, based in museums, but now we've developed more extensions for an archaeological extension, for instance, something called CRM Archeo that's being used in Ariadne. People like the Getty Institute as well, they, they, they used to develop um, vocabularies which have also been turned into linked data, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. This was just actually, a, I think that was just a highlight of that text, so I should have put that earlier so you can see the sorts of things that it's starting to pick out. Concepts like time, places, objects, how those link together. It's not just the simple sort of key matching, it's actually more complex things like coins, objects found below the pavement that date to a certain date. And those are the sorts, I think, of questions and ideas that really as an archaeologist, leaving aside all this technical stuff that I've been doing for years, that's actually the reason behind why I started doing this, is to try and answer questions like where are, you know, where are examples of the coins that, that came from that particular period? Can I search across lots of resources to find them? 
But to do that, as Julian has sort of pointed out, you need infrastructures. And again, this is where I think you know, the importance of this, without, you know, we, we will, we, I do want to talk about some of the philosophical, epistemological issues behind this. So, you, know, you knew you'd look up when I said that. <laughs> behind this. <laughs> But we have to structure, we have to try and provide some tools to enable, I think, people to want to discuss, the, who want to look for that information and pursue those sorts of questions. So this is something that came on the back of, 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 of work using the ontologies, and developing the idea that we could at least surface these, particularly vocabularies, I call them heritage vocabularies, the kind of uh, lists of words that, that archaeologists and heritage professionals commonly use. So these are just the examples that have come up from, from my work, from a Historic England perspective. My colleague Peter's lurking at the back there from Historic Environment Scotland, who are somewhere on there, I hope, although they're probably under their old name, the Royal Commission of Scotland, but forgive me for that, Peter. Um, and he will be familiar with this one, because this is work that he was very close involved in. In terms of one of the crucial things about this, I think, from the in a European context, is how we... Oh, that's very <laughs> Doesn't do that on mine. Uh, never mind. Do you care? Oh, okay. That was really quite exciting. That woke everybody up. <laughs> okay. Um, the main point was to look at this idea of persistence, which I think is, again, some of, the, some of the previous speakers were starting to look at this idea of you know, what, how we future-proof in these ideas and to what extent by using the structures and the structures that we're, we're providing in the infrastructure. <laughs> hey, I've got to move on quick. It's obviously giving me a hint. <laughs> I'm taking too long. <laughs> the main point about this was behind this that we, we incorporated other languages in, in this labelling. So rather than it just being a, a vocabulary that, that worked in English, this enables us to sort of start... It's gone away. Yeah. I, I, oh. <laughs> I, I don't... I don't see it. I can stop. Um, the main point being this sort of multilingual search, which is obviously something that, that Julian and colleagues in Ariadne are going to use more and more, but it, it's, it's this potential. It's not just us putting these things up to say, right, these, you've got to use these. It's more about this mapping process, the potential for people to do the semantics to sort of say, well, that one looks like the sort of thing that it, it might, or we have finds of that type, but actually we call them something slightly different, but, but, the, but they are, we are talking about the same sort of concept. Or much more likely as well, that there will be concepts which are similar, but because of cultural differences, we don't want to meliorate all the cultures into one sort of label. We actually want to be able to map lots of different cultural references through through a kind of spine of, of, of potential searching tools. So this this again goes back. This was just again trip down memory lane for me. But I hope. <laughs> is that enough? Yeah. Uh, I blame it. But uh, yeah, I, I think one of the challenges though is as we do this is for me, and I love to sort of surface this issue that actually understanding who is then using these things has become quite difficult. Personally, I, would, I know that there are people like these people that do oceanographic research down in Antarctica who have used some of our terminologies just in their, in their linked data to match up things to do with types of boats and types of historic boats. But there are people using it all around the world. But the next challenge for us is to really kind of understand not just what archaeologists are doing with this, but also, I think, how, what other domains, related domains, like you know, biology in terms of human remains, environmental science, climatologists, who I was in a session, very interesting session before I came here, on climatology work, and, and how they want to use some of the, the historical data, but they need it in a form that they can actually find it, and they, when, and they kind of know that they're that our data, it, when we're talking about certain things, we're talking about the same thing, so they can use it. Finally, I'll get to a, a, a new slide, <laughs> Julian, cheer Julian up. This is just really, again, to show that, that this is an ongoing process. I've been doing this now longer than I'll confess to, I think, on tape. But we are now finally 
hoping to plug, we'll be plugging these in to this online resource. This one, Oasis, has actually been running in the UK since at least 2004 and in various bits before that. But it's now a system that after 15 years, it needs upgrading. And as I think my friends in Germany were saying about the, you mentioned the point about don't type in the, the words by hand. Well, I'm afraid that, you know, for 15 years, people have been typing when it came to, because we had these, we had these thesauri, but they would, you know, the web, at the time we developed this, the web, the web facility, the, the actual online uh, technology just wasn't good enough to actually have the whole of the thesauri up online. So we still had to do that. Finally, now the technology has moved on and we can just reference the link data. So here's just, this, this is a sneak preview of this system, which they have, will be out in March 2020, won't it, Peter? Um, but again, just to make the point that semantically, this is looking at event types, if you see, we're off again in the, in the wonderful world of, of bright purple and something or other. It's looking at the excavation and obviously it's referencing the, the point that it's linking out to the heritage data terminologies again. And we actually, people just click on it and that links you in. So in the time remaining, what is it? I would like to just think forward a bit because one of the, lovely, one of the issues, again, this is the, the real point about the sort of semi-controlled nature of people typing in. And even in the field work, I know for myself, you know, when you're recording something in a dirty, muddy hole, you have to say it's kind of red and brownish. But for people doing the work with, with the computers, that's a nightmare. And as this chap said, you know, he found a, a reference to snuff, which is this stuff. You know what snuff is, probably. But who knows what colour it was? And the point being, in 150 years or more time, is anyone going to actually sort of, I mean, I doubt, have made that link data persistent. And there is this fundamental thing that it's a persistent URI and it will persist. But the technology, I'm convinced, will change in terms of how that is persisted. In the same way that we have to plan to migrate our data, our data archives, our digital archives, you know, one of the AVS's core strategies is migration. It's not just preserving it on a disk, it's actually keeping that data alive. And so I think that is, is probably something that I want to think about from the, from the point of view, perhaps coming back to our, the, first, the first set of questions, is to what extent is our data sharp? Oh, fantastic! <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh, you killed me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's probably the size of slime. <laughs> this, uh, this is the sort of thing that I am actually start thinking about now, sort of projects that we're looking forward to, and hopefully I'll be getting some money to do some of them, in terms of sort of how we're going to preserve things like, you know, not just, not just the, the link data, which is something we have a strategy, but, but all the other sorts of information which I'm trying to categorise in this very amorphous thing called heritage data. And how, how will we actually keep some of that alive? And, and, and again, it raises this question of, sort of like, the more the, the internet's amalgamating the cultural differences, what are we going to actually choose to keep alive? Again, I think I'll, I'll skip through this in the time available, but, but raising questions around sort of data analytics as well, which I just wanted to surface in terms of, because of those controlled vocabularies, I know that there is some responsibility behind that. That's the sort of stuff that people are going to start doing the analytics on. And it is an important responsibility as well that we actually do think about how we want that data to be used and plan ahead responsibly. Now, obviously, you know, we can, we can do some of it in terms of creating the, the infrastructure and the systems to, to, to make those things possible. But there are responsibilities in terms of actually making that work in a way that is suitable to different audiences. And that's why I've put that middle one up there. Again, the, to some degree, the whole question of, of how, certainly the linked, the linked data, the linked open data is going to work, also has a responsibility to, to everybody who's maybe not in, so interested in how the technology works or anything else, but is more interested in just answering some of those questions. But if you want 
to answer the questions that you have, you have to be, I think, prepared to share the data you have in a way that allows other people to question your data. And I think that, in some ways, is still a big challenge for our sector. And with that, <laughs> I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much.